Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first team facilitator training. Um, I'm Kim Seal, and I'm the executive director of Grades of Green, and I thought we'd kick things off by letting you meet the Grades of Green team. Hi, everybody. I'm Anjali Kingtop, and I am the program manager for Grades of Green. And I'm Kathy Procopio, a program advisor. I'm Robin Murphy, a program advisor. I'm Sarah Sedeka, a program advisor. Hi, everyone. I'm Malcolm Au. I'm also a program advisor. And I'm James Saracini, the marketing and communications director for Grades of Green. Uh, we'll be talking through, uh, we'll be taking you through the uh, training materials today. So, here are a few pointers for the training. Currently, everyone is muted except for the speaker. Um, so please also keep your camera off for the duration of the presentation. We don't want you guys to be distracting each other. Um, if you have any questions as we go through the training, please type them into the chat and we will stop periodically to address them. We will also be recording this so you can review the material later and we will send a follow-up email documenting questions and answers as well. We will be using the raise your hand function in the training. So let's practice it now by clicking on the participants tab and then clicking the raise hand button. I just did it. All right, seen a lot of hands being raised. It's excellent. Guess some of you are teachers. Okay, we'll also be playing Kahoot. So have a phone handy. Uh, the URL to go to is kahoot.it. That's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. A lot of you have probably used this. Feel free to open Kahoot in a, in a browser now at this point. Um, and if you don't have a smartphone with you, you can always open Kahoot in a tab in your browser. There'll be instructions for this a little bit later as well. And last but not least, have a pen and paper handy. You'll probably need them during the training. So now we're gonna go to Kim to kick things off. Hi everybody again and happy Saturday. Um, we are so excited um, that you're joining us for our first facilitator training. Um, and we're so appreciative that you've registered for the campaign. I know it's so tricky now um, with stay at home and virtual, and it's just not the norm. So um, we couldn't be more inspired and impressed that you decided to um, join us and help your students um, take some climate action this year. Uh, the Grades of Green campaigns, they're year-long programs, and we really have um, some great goals. The first thing is that um, the students will learn about an environmental issue. Um, they'll outline a project to address that issue in their community. They'll implement the project and then they'll measure and report the impact of their actions. So we're super excited for you to learn about your students' teams and projects and the impacts that they make over the next year. And I'm gonna turn it over um, to Anjali who's gonna start um, the presentation. Thanks, Kim. Um, so up on your screen now, you'll see our agenda for today. Um, welcome again, and you've got to meet our whole team. So this morning, we'll go through um, some training objectives. Then we'll move on to the phases of the Climate Solutions Campaign. First, the get ready phase, which we're in right now, um, getting ready to gear up and start the actual project of the campaign. Um, then we'll go through phase one. We'll take a short break, play Kahoot, do some other fun activities. Then we'll go through phase two and phase three. And at the end, we'll, do, we'll leave some time for some wrap up and some questions uh, if you have any. And um, I think everyone knows we will also host a second training, which we'll provide more information about um, in January um, to cover phases four and five. So uh, most of you on the call today are um, either a teacher or an adult facilitator for a campaign team. And this is how you will receive your stipend um, that we are doing this year. We're super excited about it. So first, you'll, you're, you're here. Step one is going to be complete after this. You'll complete the two-hour training today as well as the mid-year training on January 30th, along with a couple evaluation forms. You'll work with your student campaign team to complete the campaign and submit all the required materials. You'll participate in a one hour focus group in May at the conclusion of the program. And then in June, yay, cha-ching, you'll receive your $500 check. 
Um, and then also your teams need to be registered. If you haven't done so, um, we will be sending that in an email, um, the registration link, so you can make sure that you have a student team registered. The registration is also on a rolling basis, so um, we're being very flexible with the timeline this year. It's never too late to register. And uh, last but not least, there's one stipend per team. And so here are our objectives for the training today. Um, our, with our obje objectives, we want you to hold us accountable for providing you Climate Science and Environmental Justice 101, Climate Solution Campaign Goals and Overview, the team member roles, the timeline of the campaign and the tasks. We'll cover um, eco grants, how, what they are and how to receive them. We'll gain your familiarity with the guidebook through phase three. We'll provide an overview of phases four and five during the January 30th training. We'll also go through key activities by phase. And we'll talk about some additional resources, such as Take Note coming up on October 8th at 1215. One of our um, amazing funders and supporters for a long time, the LA County Sanitation Districts, will be hosting a really cool virtual field trip. So we'll make sure to get that information out to you as well. But for now, save the date. And now here's uh, Kathy to go through some of our campaign goals. So now we're gonna turn to the goals we have for your students. By the end of the campaign, they will gain broad climate knowledge with focused knowledge in one or two topic areas. They'll understand the impact climate change has on where they live. They'll practice some project management skills like creating a task list and identifying a campaign type and an audience for their project and measuring their project impact at the end. They'll know, they'll show their community evidence of the environmental impact of their work. They'll understand the definition of environmental justice and be able to cite examples of environmental justice issues where they live. And they'll learn leadership skills like collaborating with their teammates, generating creative ideas, thinking critically, conducting reliable research, speaking in public, and reaching out to experts and people, authorities. So your first entry point into the campaign is the get ready phase. Uh, we emailed you a link to this phase about 10 days ago, um, and that will give you access to our guidebook. The guidebook is going to contain all the required forms and the questionnaires to complete the campaign, as well as a ton of additional resources. The guidebook is written with your students as the audience, but we think the more familiar you are with it, the stronger their projects will be. And just take note that anything you see today that has a white background is actually a screenshot straight out of the guidebook. So you're kind of getting a, an idea of what the guidebook looks like and it's completely accessible to you. This campaign map gives an overview of how the whole campaign is organized. And you can see that it's broken down into three main sections. They're in blue, ready, set, and go. And then from there, it's broken down to five phases. Phase one, learn. Phase two, pick your project. Phase three, create a plan. Phase four, take action. And phase five, share your success. Um, as Anjali said, in today's training, we're just gonna be covering get ready through phase three, but we will cover phases four and five in the January 30th training. So let's look at get ready. In the get ready phase, that's where you are now. Students are gonna build their team. They're gonna to get to know their advisors. Um, they're going to review the phases in the online guidebook, and then they'll attend the welcome webinar on October 3rd, which is next weekend. And that webinar is going to give the students a, a short intro to climate science and environmental justice, an intro into the campaign, and how they can win the eco grants. And we really urge, if at all possible, your students should attend the webinar live. We realize it's a Saturday morning, but if you can get that link to them and have them RSVP, it will be great for them to attend live because they'll have an opportunity to meet their peers around the world. Um, but the webinar will be recorded uh, for team members who can't attend live. In phase one, learn, um, teams are gonna be introduced to climate science and environmental inequality. Uh, we're gonna also introduce five topics that have significant impact on climate, energy, transportation, food, waste, and trees. And then they'll choose one of these five topics to work on for the rest of the year. And last of all, they'll create a team vision statement that tells why the topic they chose matters to them and to the earth. 
In phase two, pick your project, the teams will explore solutions and projects that address the climate impacts of the topic they chose in phase one. Um, they're gonna learn about different types of campaigns they can work on um, from a public education campaign to an institutional change campaign. And then they'll reach out to a local expert for advice on um, selecting and defining a project that is tailored to the needs of their community. And then in phase three, create a plan. Teams are gonna learn how to set greenhouse gas reduction goal. They're gonna identify an audience for their cam campaign. They're gonna learn about advocacy strategies and how to develop a key message statement. And they'll create a project task list. And this phase will uh, conclude with a mid-year webinar on February 6th. And that webinar will give the teams a chance to share their project plans with their peers around the world. And again, like the first webinar, we really urge your students to attend that webinar live, uh, but it will be recorded. So phase three asks teams to do a lot, but once they get through this phase, they are really gonna be ready to go forth and take action. Um, we did just cover through phase three, but fear not, phases four and five will be covered in the January 20th, uh, 30th um, facilitator training. So now I'm gonna turn this presentation over to Robin and she's gonna tell you about who's who on your team and how you can win an eco grant. Hi everybody. Um, I know that was a lot to take in, but don't worry, you'll have plenty of support throughout your campaign. So next we're gonna talk about who's on your team. And these are pages straight out of our campaign guidebook. So your eco leaders. Um, those are the students. They'll be the people who will actually be doing the tasks of the campaign. So they're going to be the planners, the visionaries, and the workers. You are the team facilitator. So your role is going to be to be your team's local boots on the ground troubleshooter. So our program is global with teams in the U.S., including California, Michigan, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, and also beyond the U.S. We have teams in Cameroon, Kenya, Nairobi, Uganda, India, and Colombia this year. So we're gonna need your local knowledge of your school, your city, and your region to help us support your team. We are the Grades of Green Campaign Advisors. So it's our job to provide your team with custom advice to help them plan and execute their project. We're your partner and their partner. We'll be in touch about once a week, but feel free to reach out to your advisor anytime by phone, text, email, messenger, WhatsApp, or let us know the best way to keep in touch with you. And keep your eye out for this icon in the guidebook. Whenever you see the advisor icon, um, your team should connect with their advisor. Also on our team are James and Katie. They're the Grades of Green Marketing and Communications team. They're not listed in the guidebook, but they can be a really important resource for your team. They can provide your team with special guidance in how to create a targeted and sophisticated message that can inspire and influence the supporters for their project. Now we're gonna to get to a couple really important forms. The first form is the Grades of Green Consent and Permission form. So it's very important that we need every student on your team to have a parent or guardian complete this consent and permission form. So we would really appreciate it if you guys could help ensure these waivers are completed as soon as possible. If you have a student who joins your team after the initial get ready phase, that's totally okay. We welcome students to come on board at any time, but their very first task as a team member should be to have their guardian fill out this consent and permission form and have it turned in. We also need you or one student on your team to complete the About Our Team form. We just need one of these per team, and this will give us some information about your team as a whole. So why do these forms matter? Well, we wanna be able to talk up your teams all year. We wanna tell the whole world what your team's trying to accomplish and work as their partner to promote their work in the press and on social media. Anjali will be sending these forms out to you in a follow-up email, but you can also access them anytime in the guidebook in the, on the Get Ready page of the guidebook. So thanks so much for your help getting these forms in. So now we're gonna get to the fun part, um, how to earn points towards an eco-grant. So we've mentioned a few times that the Climate so Solutions Campaign is organized as a contest. <laughs> Teams that submit the required phase assignments will be eligible to have their materials reviewed by a panel of outside environmental experts to receive an eco-grant of up to $1,000 so they can continue their climate work. 
So when you click on the link that the arrow is pointing to, you'll arrive at a page that outlines exactly how your team can earn the maximum points towards an eco grant. And it'll look like this. So throughout each phase, the teams can earn maximum points for a section by clearly and completely filling out the questionnaire according to the instructions. They can earn partial credit for incomplete answers or answers that are generic. The chart lists all the forms and questions that must be submitted to be eligible to be considered for the eco grants. The target dates for when the forms and questions should be submitted and how many points each submission is worth. We've, also, we've included a target completion date for the teams by each phase, but the work by no means has to be completed by the dates. These dates are put there to keep your team on track, but they're flexible. So we'll also be providing some opportunities throughout the campaign for your team to earn bonus points. So be on the lookout throughout the campaign book for that. So now we're gonna to get to um, another page that you'll see in the guidebook. And this is a really super helpful section. Listed here is each phase, the optimal number of weeks that teams should spend on each phase, and a target completion date. It also has the total number of points allotted to each phase. Now, when you click on one of these headers, the tasks your team must complete in that phase will drop down. Items marked with a green check indicate a required submission. So this is a questionnaire that has to be filled out in order to be eligible to be considered for the eco grants. The bulleted items are highly recommended actions that will help your team, your campaign team be more successful. Now, before we move on to phase one, Anjali, do we have any questions in the chat that we should cover? We don't have any questions yet, but um, participants, if you do have questions, please send them in the chat. So Malcolm, if you want to take over and cover phase one. Alrighty, thanks Anjali. All right, so now we're going to move into phase one, learn. This is where all the fun begins. So your teams will get a brief introduction to climate science and environmental justice in the welcome webinar on October 3rd. But let's first take a minute and watch this three minute overview to kick off the campaign. Hi, my name is Malcolm Al, and I'm one of the program advisors for Grades of Green, here to do a little Sorry, everyone. I think we're having um, a little audio difficulty with the video. Give us one second. Let's see if Malcolm can get that back up. If not, um, we do have this video on our website. Um, it is up in phase one. So you'll be able to watch the recap there as well. But hopefully we can get it working and share it with you today. If not, we can definitely uh, move on. I think Malcolm is just trying to reboot. Let's see. Oxide into the atmosphere. Today, there is 30% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there was in 1750. In fact, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today than at any. Were you guys able to hear that? We had it for a little bit. I think. My name is Malcolm Al. Let's. Malcolm, maybe let's try the next video. And everyone, um, if you can go ahead and watch this one on our website, and we'll send you the link out in the email afterwards as well. Sure thing. Um, so like Anjali said, um, this video will be on our website, um, and it's kind of a kickoff to um, the, the whole campaign. Um, I want to take note that this is the first bonus point that your team can earn. So by watching this video, um, the video before, um, and answering questions, they're eligible to earn one bonus point. Okay, so now we'll be switching gears um, from telling you about the campaign to actually letting you practice elements of the campaign in a shorthand version. So we invited a group of young environmentalists to introduce your teams to five critical topics that Kathy mentioned earlier 
that impact the climate crisis. Those topics are energy, transportation, food, waste, and trees. So we asked these environmentalists to present their topics as if they were appearing on the TV show Shark Tank. Each one of these pitches of the five topics, um, they pitch them in order to convince your team to focus on that, that topic for your climate campaign. So your teams will watch this video as a part of phase one. The full video is 17 minutes, but can be broken up by topic and watched individually. If your team is a bit younger or has a little bit shorter attention span, like myself, um, I suggest that you watch the video introduction and then you can watch each topic one by one. You'll be able to access this through the deep dive page, which we'll go on to show you later. So although we don't have time to watch the full 17 minute video right now, we're gonna cover one topic and I'm getting a little hungry. So we're gonna cover the food section of the Shark Tank video. And let's see if this audio works. Please um, type in the chat um, if you guys are not able to hear the audio for this video. Now entering the Shark Tank is Vivica to convince you that food is the best way for your team to take on climate change. Food. Food unites everyone around the world every day because we all need to eat. Every day we choose what we're going to purchase and eat. But how often do we think about how food affects our climate? Every aspect of our food system, from producing it, to transporting it, to managing the waste produced greenhouse gases, contributes to climate change. As a matter of fact, food production and processing are responsible for approximately 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, most of our food is produced in an industrial system of factory farms filled with animals raised in inhumane conditions and crops reliant on pesticides and fertilizers. On top of all the greenhouse gases produced by this system, it also emits dangerous pollution into the land, air, and water in forms of animal waste, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides, and industrial emissions. There are a lot of environmental justice issues when it comes to food. Food-related pollution is often concentrated in low-income communities and communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color who live and work nearby. This pollution can lead to severe health problems. On top of this, Low-income communities and communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color may live in food deserts, which are regions where there is limited access to healthy, sustainably produced food that's affordable. This leads to a higher risk of diet-related conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. The good news is that food is a source of pollution and climate change that is largely in our control as consumers. The decision we make about food every day can make a huge difference to our planet. Some foods are more harmful to the environment than others. For instance, the production of meat, especially beef, produces a much larger amount of greenhouse gases and uses much more water than plant-based proteins like beans or nuts. And buying foods that are local and in season produce less greenhouse gases than buying foods that are processed and transported from far away. And no matter what we eat, food that is wasted ends up in a landfill, which emits a harmful greenhouse gas called methane that has an outsized impact on worsening the climate crisis. There are many ways you can make a difference. You can eat less meat, especially beef, and convince institutions to do the same. One of the great ways to do this is to advocate for Meatless Monday programs. You can promote organic and locally produced foods. Start a garden or support a community garden. Help promote and advocate for a local farmer's market or CSA. Or start composting and get your school and community to start too. Finally, you can convince people to waste less food. Hungry for change? Pick a project focused on food and your team can help your community fight climate change and make healthy choices that are good for their bodies and the planet. All right, so along with the Shark Tank video, the guidebook includes a written summary of each pitch 
with key concepts and statistics pulled out so that teams can not only listen to the pitch, but they can also review points and think carefully about which topic speaks to them the most. So right here on the screen, you can see a written pitch summary for the topic that we've selected today, food. So like I mentioned before, as you can see, there are key concepts as well as key statistics that are mentioned in the actual pitch itself shown on our website. So once your team has watched all the Shark Tank pitches and reviewed the written summaries, they're ready to start diving even deeper into the topic that they choose. By clicking on the green deep, deep dive button shown here, um, they're able to learn more about the topic or topics that interest them. So we're gonna continue and follow the food topic through the guidebook. So this brings us to our deep dive section. So this is where your team will learn even more about the topic that interests them. So you can see that each deep dive section starts with the Shark Tank pitch video um, for that topic. So your team can always rewatch re it if they want to. And this is where it'll be split up into each uh, individual topic. So right now we're gonna take a pause um, and is there any questions in the chat that um, can be answered, Anjali? Yeah, so we have a, a few really good questions. Um, kind of going back to the get ready phase. Um, so we'll just head back there for a minute. Um, the first question was about the number of students on a team, the ideal number. We get this question a lot. Um, this year, we've honestly, we've set up the campaign um, for, I feel like it's teams one to 50 <laughs> about. Um, so uh, we have students that are gonna be working alone as well as in a group. Um, a class is welcome to work on it together. Um, teachers can use this as a project in their class. Also um, school clubs. We also have some students that are participating just with friends that don't even go to the same school. So like a group of buddies that go to three different schools, you're welcome to jump aboard. Um, another way that, and I think we're gonna address this later, but another great thing um, that classes can do um, that we've had uh, classes teachers do in the past is you can split your, um, your, your class up into different groups. Um, each group can work on a project as a team. So you could have like a group working on all five different topics, um, each one tackling um, a different topic and doing a different program. And we can help you set that up with your advisor. Um, and then the last most important question, just some clarification on the eco grants. So um, the eco grants that we have available are up to $1,000. We do offer um, several at the end of the program. So basically what happens is we take all of your wonderful uh, material that you turn into us and we put that into a form and we consult some expert judges um, outside of Grades of Green because we cannot judge you guys. <laughs> we love all of you, it's too hard for us. So we have a panel um, that will come in and help us make those decisions. We usually offer about six to eight eco grants ranging anywhere from $250 up to $1,000. Um, so there are several um, available. Also in your local area, if you find um, grant opportunities, we're, help, we're, we're happy to help you um, go after those and write letters for you as well to get those. Um, so I think we've got, um, a couple other questions. So if you have two classes, they can definitely be two separate teams. Um, we'll just have different team names for those and you can be the same facilitator for both teams. Um, and then as far as the consent, consent forms, your advisor will know um, who's turned in the consent form so we can keep, um, keep you up to date on that. You can also um, request that the student let you know when they turn it in, but we will be tracking that and know which students have turned it in um, and for which team. So we'll, we'll send um, that over to you. And um, for there, we had one other question about research. We're gonna um, jump into that um, in a second. So that'll get, um, get answered there. And um, your, the guidebook is on the website. Just wanna make that clear. So when your advisor emailed you a couple weeks ago, they sent you out the get ready phase. Um, and I will also send that out in the follow-up email today. So you'll be able to see that. The, the, the guidebook will come up um, throughout the campaign. So the whole thing isn't up yet, but you'll be able to see um, parts of it now. And I think that's all the questions for now. So Malcolm, if you wanna um, go ahead and move on. 
Cool, yeah, thanks, Anjali. Those are all great questions. Um, as they come up, please uh, keep typing them in the chat and we will do our best to pause and, and answer these questions. Okay, cool. So let's put some of uh, this campaign into practice right now. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna take 10 minutes. Um, feel free to stretch, grab a snack, use the restroom, um, but you're also going to have to read the deep dive, which is here on the screen, um, for the food topic. Um, and so Anjali is also going to be sending this link in the chat so that you're also able to see it in a separate browser um, if you'd like to. So go ahead and take 10 minutes to do that. Um, I'm going to put a timer up on the screen. Um, and just because you're adult facilitators, that doesn't mean you've escaped pop quizzes um, just yet. So make sure you read it carefully. Um, at, a, at about one minute, I'm going to pause the timer and show some instructions for Kahoot, which is our um, next game. So if you are familiar with this, um, what you're gonna do is grab your mobile phone, um, open up any web browser, and you're gonna type in um, kahoot.it. So that's spelled K-A-H-O-O-T, and then a period, I-T, um, and then I will give more instructions with one minute left. So go ahead and start reading um, the deep dive for food. Hello. Okay, so yeah, just a reminder, continue to read um, the deep dive here for food. Um, we have about six more minutes, use the restroom, grab a snack, um, have a little stretch, um, and then we'll be continuing shortly.
All right, thank you everyone for uh, reading the food deep dive. In about 30 seconds, I'm gonna be um, switching to over to our Kahoot game. So if you haven't done so yet, please either um, in a browser in your phone or you're able to do it on your computer as well, please type in the following. It's kahoot.it, again spelled out K-A-H-O-O-T period I-T. So we're gonna go ahead and switch over to that right now. So when you type in kahoot.it, you should be able to put in the game pin. The game pin is at the top of this page here. Um, it should be 8008620. Looks like we have some awesome teachers and adult facilitators who are already on. So go ahead and put in that game code um, and then put in a nickname for yourself. And I'm gonna wait for um, all of us to get on here and then we'll get started with this game. Alrighty, awesome. Yeah, keep, um, we're gonna leave it open, open for another minute or two. Um, keep signing up on kahoot.it. Okay, if you're just joining us coming back from break, um, please log on to a web browser on your phone um, at kahoot.it, and then you're gonna type in the game pin at the top of the page here. Again, that number is 800-8620. I'm gonna give it one more minute, and then we're gonna get started with our Kahoot. Okay, last chance to join our Kahoot game. We're gonna get started in about 30 seconds here. Okay, here we go, we're gonna get started. I hope you guys studied up well on our food deep dive. All right, so the first question is, what are some actions that we can perform to reduce our food greenhouse gas footprint? Eat a plant-based diet, buy seasonal and locally grown foods, compost foods, or all of the above. So please select the corresponding answer on your phone or mobile browser. All right, wow, good job. You guys are smart ones. These are in fact all great ways um, to reduce our food greenhouse gas footprint. All right, Carrie Strong taking the lead uh, with Danielle and Megan slowly coming up in second and third. Good job, everyone. All right, next question. What percent of food is wasted in the United States? Okay, so in the United States, about 40% of all food is wasted, and that's not only 
um, from our households, but that's all the way down the line from produ production to transportation to being sold at the grocery store, all the way to our households. Oh, we've got some leaders moving up. Good job, everyone. Next question, um, what is a food desert? Alrighty, yes, so a food desert is a region where people have limited access to healthy and affordable food. Um, and this year with our climate campaign, we really wanna stress um, teaching all our students about you know, environmental injustices um, and examples of that within their community. We're gonna move on to our last and final question. All right, somebody catch up to Megan, Sam and Christina on the leaderboard. Last question, which food uses the most resources to produce per unit? All right, five seconds, get those answers in. Wow, great job, that's 100%. Um, yeah, so beef, in fact, does use the most resources to, to produce per unit. Good job, everyone. All right, let's find out who our winners are. Third place, Christina, great job, Christina. In second place, we have Sam, good job, Sam. And first place, we have Megan, awesome. Thank you guys uh, for participating in our Kahoot. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, um, a lot of these deep dives have really important and useful information. Um, so your students are able to, you know, find out more about what topic really interests them and uh, make a decision based on that. So now we're going to turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to give you, um, tell you about more opportunities for your students to dive deep into their knowledge of climate topics. Thanks, Malcolm. So in addition to providing more information, the deep dive sections of the guidebook also provide several solution ideas for the climate problems discussed in the deep dive, as well as projects your team could do to work toward those solutions. For example, reducing meat consumption is a solution to one of the climate problems discussed in the food deep dive and meatless Mondays and including vegetarian or meatless options in school or restaurants are both project ideas to achieve that solution. Your team is also able to come up with their own project. And you'll notice that there are some icons associated with each project, but we'll talk more on that in phase two. Next, you'll find the Delve Deeper section of the Deep Dive, where you can find even more resources your teams can use to learn about their topic. These resources include videos, articles, lists of organizations that address each topic, and firsthand stories from people who have experienced the impacts of environmental inequality related to the topic. Once your team has fully explored a topic or two that interests them, it's time for them to choose one of the five topics to work on for their campaign. And they will do that on this form, which is one of the required campaign submissions. Check out what these submissions look like in the guidebook so you'll notice them as you move through the guidebook. We're going to skip this submission for now, but all the forms that are embedded in the campaign are essential and must be done. And please note, for all the embedded forms in the guidebook like this one, your team only needs to submit one per team. So in the vision section, we want your teams to consolidate all they've learned about their topic into a powerful vision statement for their team. We've provided your teams with a bunch of examples of environmental vision statements. Once they've read these examples, have them use what they know and about their topic to write their own vision statement using the questions on the following questionnaire. So let's all write a food vision now. Just answer each question on the screen in your notebooks and when all your answers are put together, you'll have your vision statement. I'll give you about four minutes to jot down your answers to these four questions. 
And when you have a vision and feel comfortable sharing, please click the raise hand icon that we talked about and we'll call on a few volunteers to read the vision that they've written. And don't worry about getting it perfect. This is just so you can dip your toes into what your kids will be doing. Malcolm, can you go back one slide to show the examples of the visions as well? We'll keep this up for a minute or two and then we'll go back to the questions as well. Let's take one more minute to wrap up your thoughts and answer these questions. And make sure to use the raise hand function. Um, don't be shy if you want to share your uh, vision statement with all of us. Thank you. Alrighty, um, Anjali, do we have any people with their hands raised? Yeah, so let's uh, let's start with Deshna, who is all the way over in India. Can you share your vision statement with us? Yeah, uh, hi. So um, why is your topic important? Uh, we deal with waste management in general. Um, and uh, I think everything deserves a second chance at life, including waste items. So, and even if it's not that, uh, it can be recycled again, you know, you made into something else. So something around uh, that line that, you know, you know slow, slow on the impact of climate change. Um, describe what you want to see happen in the future. I want um, maybe a little to um, like sugary, but then maybe a world where we do not have to find uh, people struggling for clean air, for clean water for you know, uh, living quarters that are hygienic because most of them have been made on a landfill or they are living in a landfill um, can be achieved by, I don't believe in 50 year olds as in, of course, go ahead, do it. It's a good thing. But um, we, if we can't undo, maybe we can do it again 
so maybe the youth or people of my age you know uh, with this project joining hands in uh, efficiently waste management in schools in colleges especially that, that places that are um, habitat like where we uh, spend a lot of time in and our team's vision statement is um, um, making the world a cleaner safer healthier place to live in by taking small steps every day so even if it, that means just saving two pieces of paper to be recycled instead of throwing it in the bin then maybe that wonderful thank you so much for sharing Daishna. that was that was great and we're we're excited that you're going to put forth your vision um, in the campaign so let's um let's hear a we have time for a few more so let's hear from lisa goldfarb hi so um the vision statement i came up with is switching the onus from consumers to producers of single-use plastics requiring them to be held financially responsible for waste solutions and to provide climate safe alternatives So that was the, the vision. Well, that was amazing. Um, Anjali, I think you may be on mute. Oh, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> I was. All right, we had a little, te my technical problem. Thanks, Kathy. Um, usually it's us telling Kathy that she's on mute. So that was a little reverse um, for us today. So um, thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, let's do a couple more. Just the team's vision statement would be great. Um, I believe all the way over in Africa, let's hear from Awanjia Jr. Can you unmute? Yes, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, welcome. The vision state, thank you, thank you very much. The statement I could come out with, my vision statement is that we should strive, strive to respect the golden rule Why thriving to see a world without food waste. Because I was actually very surprised, surprised hearing that there is wastage of food in America, while some people in Africa don't have the ability to have a day's food, a, a good day's meal. So actually, if we can respect the golden rule and see our neighbors as ourselves, have a bit of empathy, each one can have at least a bit of food a day, and we can avoid world wasting food. Thank you. Yeah, yes, in addition to in what you just said now, honestly, in Africa, people are starving to death. So I'm so surprised today to see that uh, a whole 40% of food is being wasted. Oh, wow. That is so huge. Yeah, it is huge. And, um, you know, we agree. We, we, food waste is a problem that really needs to be addressed. And hopefully we can make a big impact this year with the campaign. Um, we just have time for one more. We appreciate you all sharing and your eagerness. Um, let's go ahead and hear from Danielle. Danielle, if you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Um, Perfect. Uh, Go ahead. We uh, can hear you, Danielle. Okay, great. Hi, Kathy. Um, so I was thinking about um, what would most apply to, well, for me personally and for my students would be the reducing food waste. Um, so thinking about how the food waste produces methane gases. Um, so a world of less food waste can be achieved by only buying what, buying and eating what you need in order to reduce the amount of methane released into the atmosphere. That's how far I got. That's wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. I mean, all of these visions, we thank you all for sharing. All these vision statements are wonderful and we can't wait to see them come to life to make a really big impact. Um, in the campaign. So we want to stay um, true on time and respect everyone's time. We want to hear from everybody, but we definitely need to move on now. So thank you so much to everybody for sharing. Um, 
and we'd love to hear more um, in the future and we can't wait to see your campaign. So we're gonna move on um, and back, bring it back to Sarah. Thank you everyone for sharing. Those are really good vision statements. Um, so now before we leave this phase, I just wanna call to your attention to the fact that your team will have its second chance to get bonus points here. Um, they can take their vision and turn it into something special, a team logo or a slogan. And also let's check the chat to see if we have any questions about info on either the get ready or phase one sections of the guidebook. Sure, thanks Sarah. Um, so just a couple things um, to address in far, as far as questions go. Um, we have had some requests to for students to be able to connect with other students. Um, it's so great that we have teams from all over the world. We can definitely set that up. You can speak with your advisor um, directly about connecting with some other students. We would love that. Um, and then just one other um, quick thing. If you already, if there's a team who's already been working on a project and you want to continue with that project using the guidance of the campaign, that's no problem at all. So we understand that, you know, some teams might already have their topic ready to go and filled out. So you're more than welcome to continue on with the project um, and pick up with the campaign to, um, to create your impact um, even further. So thanks so much. We're going to move on to Kathy, who's going to let us know about phase two. Okay, here we are in phase two, pick your project. In phase two, your teams are gonna get a chance to explore potential solutions and related projects, and they'll learn about different campaign types, and they'll reach out to a local expert to learn what projects would have the biggest impact where they live. To start off though, your teams should check out some of the solution and project ideas that we provided for their topic. But since Malcolm picked food as the topic for us today, Let's check out some of the food related climate solutions that are listed in the guidebook. Um, listed under food, the food topic are four possible solutions students can choose from. Reducing meat consumption, promoting tropical forest friendly foods, promoting sustainably produced foods, and reducing food waste. Teams can also click to see a list of projects that support each solution. Let's take a look at what projects were listed under reduce food waste. We've listed promoting composting, food donations, um, home food waste reduction, and tracking food waste as a waste reduction strategy. Um, also note that your team is able to come up with their own project that's specific to their community. Uh, now that you've seen a jumping off place for lots of potential uh, solutions and projects, let's turn it over to James and he's gonna talk about campaign types. All right, everyone. Um, so now we're going to be talking about campaign types. Um, I'm kind of the resident communications guy. So a lot of this communication stuff I'll be leading um, and I'm happy to answer any of your students' questions. So after years of running campaigns, we've kind of learned that our students' projects fall under these four categories that you can see on screen. Public education and action campaigns, institutional change campaigns, event promotion campaigns, and program adoption campaigns. Using these campaigns types helps uh, organize the whole experience for our students and provides them with more direction and clarity. So to give you an idea of what each entails, we'll go through one of these more deeply in a second. But first, let's do an overview. So uh, let's first talk about the public education and action campaign. The goal of this campaign is to get people in general to take action and change their habits. This is what we think of when we think of advocacy campaigns. Um, these are the public service announcements, posts from nonprofits, uh, political campaigns, asking people to take action and change their habits. And the audience are specific members of the public. The second group, um, or the second campaign type, I should say, are institutional change campaigns. Uh, some of our most impactful teams in the past have, con uh, have conducted institutional change campaigns. And the goal of this is to get institutions to change their policies to become more sustainable. By institutions, we mean organizations like schools, governments, and businesses. Students will target two different audience groups, typically, um, one or the other, or both. And these are the decision makers and stakeholders. We'll get into this a little bit later. So then event promotion campaigns and program adoption campaigns have a lot in common with public information or public education campaigns, I should say. The difference really is their goal. So event promotion campaigns, um, for them, the goal is to drive groups to an event, either created by the students themselves or by another organization. 
So for example, this would be a beach cleanup, um, a green summit, um, like or an environmental justice webinar, things like that. During COVID, these events will probably be virtual, but you know who knows what happens uh, next year. Um, so we definitely wanted to include information on this. And then the last is a program adoption campaign. So the goal of this is to drive participation in programs run by cities, nonprofits, or other institutions, or even the teams that own program. And so that would be something like a city-run composting program, an ocean-friendly restaurant certification for a business, et cetera. So next, um, we're going to go through the public education campaign to give you an idea of what this organizational structure around campaign types does for teams. So first, by setting these types, it allows teams to figure out their purpose. We already kind of discussed the purpose for each campaign type, but for a public education campaign, again, um, this is driving their audience to change their habits. So the audience here, um, we'll be asking students to refine their audiences into target audiences, which we'll get into a little more fully in phase 3.1. Um, but the goal of setting a target audience is to help students better understand who, um, exactly who they're talking to when crafting their message. Um, and so for a public education and action campaign, this is very important as just, you know, the public is too broad of an audience. Students will need to get more specific and we'll lead them to do that. An example of this would be uh, the parents at my school, as opposed to people in my community, right? So then the message, this is the basis of what the students outreach and presentation materials will include. Um, they'll be creating key messages in phase three as well, and using that as a basis of the rest of the things they write to promote their solution. Finally, strategies. These are the ways that the students will actually be reaching their audience. For this campaign type, um, there are two ways students will be doing their outreach. One is typically uh, in person, Be but uh, because COVID kind of throws that out of the window, we, we, we still want to cover this because they could be doing virtual events or virtual presentations, and we never know what next year brings, right? This is a year long campaign. The, uh, the other sort of strategy here, the group of strategies are digital advocacy campaigns and, and things of that nature. And this is probably the primary way that students will be engaging their audience during this campaign. And so these are the classic examples, right? Social media campaigns, email marketing campaigns, uh, posting website content, press outreach and media. There's a lot more, but these are just some examples. So once your team has read up on the different campaign types and sort of understood what they'll be doing, your team will um, fill out form 2.2 to show comprehension of these campaign types. Next, we're gonna go to Kathy to tell you about talking to experts. So by the time your students reach 2.3, they'll have chosen their topic and their solution, and they'll have learned about the campaign types they can organize. They'll be then ready to get expert advice on what project would best serve their community. And this graphic shows categories of potential experts, experts in the school realm, experts in the community realm, and experts in the business sector that your teams could approach for advice. Um, and since we've picked reducing food waste, um, good old Malcolm, <laughs> for today's training, um, let's take a minute to brainstorm who our students would actually contact to learn about good projects for reducing food waste, food waste where they live. So think about it for a second. If your students were going to work on reducing food waste, who would you have them contact for guidance? And we're going to give everybody, everybody one minute of thinking time and then um, Type your ideas into the chat and we can use this brain pool of people we have assembled today at the training to get some good ideas on who students could reach out to to get expert advice on reducing food waste. All right, we're getting some really, really good ideas in. Um, they're coming in so fast, I can't even read them all. Um, we've got, oh, Food Finders, which is a great local um, organization here. I'm not sure if they're nationwide. Jump in if you know. I know they're in California. Um, your city's waste management, that's a really great one. Nutrition services at your school, I love that. Also similar, school district cafeteria manager. 
goes along with nutritional services. I love this. There's lots of head of nutritional services. Wonderful. I love this one. A chef, like a local chef, they'll always know how to use that food into something new. What a great idea. Um, so similar to food finders, um, thank you, FISA. Companies who pick up food at schools um, after lunch and donate it. There are several um, organizations like food finders that do that, and they'll donate it to a local um, shelter or church. Grocery store manager is a great one. I'm going to go through a few more. County sanitation department, that's great. Also your um, local city sanitation department if you have one. An environmental manager, that's wonderful. Local food banks. School boards, yes, reach out to your school board. Um, custodial staff is great. Um, custodial staff is often overlooked. Um, Grace of Green has a long history of working very closely with custodial staff. We love them. We want to make them our best friends. Um, and yeah, it definitely depends on, you know, the school you're at in your community, especially, you know, with people all over the world. It's going to be a huge different variety. We're so excited to see um, what experts you find locally in your area. Um, also some great ones. I'm sorry, I got to keep going because these are so good. Um, a food purchaser for the school district. That's great. Local colleges, wonderful. Um, we've got restaurant owners. Yes, public health department. That's a really good one. Um, allow restaurants to, so public health department to allow restaurants to distribute leftover food on a larger scale. Great. Um, Oh, this is a great new one too. Promoting and supporting farmers to use tropical friendly trees and crops in the communities. Um, I'm gonna just throw a shout out out here. <laughs> um, if you guys haven't seen the new documentary, Kiss the Ground, um, it's wonderful, it's on Netflix. I encourage everyone to, to check it out. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of really good ideas. Thank you so much for sending those all in. Uh, I think those, hopefully those give you um, lots of good ideas. Um, one last one is, oh, I haven't heard of this mis Misfits Market, um, like Imperfect Foods is an Imperfect Foods is another one, using um, markets that take food that might be normally thrown out and then um, sell it. So there's uh, lots of different um, companies like that popping up. So check them out. Thank you, everyone. I hope this helped um, with helping your team find, um, find your local expert. Um, and remember, if your students or your team get stuck at identifying an expert for their project, just reach out to your advisor. We're happy to, to help you with some suggestions and also actually help you reach out to the, the local person as well. And here's Kathy again. Oh my gosh, I, that was so inspiring because I wish you had been in the office when we were trying to brainstorm this list of people different experts you could come up with it was not nearly as good as the group you just came up with so bravo getting um, a bunch of minds together um once your team has identified an expert or two that they want to contact uh, they can check out a couple of templates that we've made to help them make that initial contact so there's a template you can see here for emailing an expert um, and uh, there's a template for phoning an expert. And once your team has identified which expert they want to reach out to, they're going to fill out questionnaire 2.3. Uh, then in 2.4, your teams are going to be putting together everything they've chosen for their project during phase two. In this questionnaire, they're going to record the solution they've chosen, the campaign type they've chosen, and the project they're going to do. And also at the end of phase two, and I think you're gonna love this, your students are going to receive a link to a Google Doc of their personalized project map. So every time your kids submit responses to the questions that are embedded in the guidebook, key answers from their submissions are gonna populate this project map. So they're gonna have an ongoing record at all times of what they have submitted to date about their project. So their map is gonna show the vision statement they wrote to guide them about their topic the topic they've chosen, the solution they want to achieve, the project they're going to take on, the type of campaign they want to run, they can always check back on their personal project map to see where they are in the campaign. Um, and at this point, Anjali, do we have any new questions in the chat? Yeah, a couple. So the topics uh, we introduced at the beginning, we've got the five topics, energy, food, waste, transportation, and trees. So on our example on here, the um, topic we've been using throughout is food. 
Um, one other one other thing that I wanted to address is I want to make sure that this is I feel like this is the coolest part of the campaign. It's super exciting for teams. We are providing this for you. You don't have to fill out um, anything on here. We're going to provide it as a Google Doc. If you can't access a Google Doc, we'll send it either as a Word document or as a PDF. So don't worry about that. And we'll be taking your answers and plugging them in so that you always have your um, ongoing kind of map of information that you put in. We'll also be providing um, some extra little tidbits in here that, um, that are specific to your team. And let's see, I think those are all the questions that we've got right now. So let's go ahead and move on to James, who's gonna walk us through phase three. All right, so uh, phase three, this phase, uh, your team will be creating a plan to take their campaign from a project idea to a climate solution reality. So uh, this is a very detailed plan um, and there's a lot of steps. And so throughout it, please reach out to your advisor if you have any questions at all. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts, so it's really important to be um, in really good contact with your advisor. So the first step is to pick, uh, the students will be picking their target audience they will be setting their greenhouse gas goals. They will develop their key messages. They will pick their campaign strategies. They would develop their advocacy goals. And last but not least, they will outline a task list to get it all done. So the first step is to pick a target audience. We mentioned this a little bit before, but um, a target audience is simply a group of individuals who have something in common. So uh, here's a few examples, right? The parents at your school, the customers at the Happy Food Grocery Store on 4th Street, household food purchasers, my city council. By setting target audiences, this allows students to develop more effective messages and helps them figure out what campaign strategies they'll use. And why is this a good idea? It's because the messages they produce will be tailored to their audiences, which means that they'll be, like I said, a lot more effective. This is a really great way for students to improve their persuasive writing skills and to think about audience before they make, um, make their messages. So to illustrate how a target audience works in practice, let's dig into an international change, or sorry, international, an institutional change campaign. So institutional change campaigns have two main audiences. First are decision makers, and the second are shareholders. Decision makers. These are the leaders who help set policy for an institution. For instance, these are the mayors, the city council members, a CEO of a business, the school superintendent, or the school board. The call to action for students when they're reaching out to decision makers is to change the policies of the institution. And so typically students will reach out to those folks through meetings or presenting at public meetings. And by setting these target audience, it will help their students set their messaging too. So for instance, for a decision maker, they may wanna highlight the impact of the institution's financial health or longevity. This is kind of the, the thought process of having them set their, their target audiences, right? It's going to allow them to set their uh, calls to action, set the, the messaging itself. The second target audience for an institutional change campaign would be the institution's shareholders, um, or I'm sorry, stakeholders. Uh, these are also the people that pay the institution's bills, for instance, or have some other influence over the decision makers. Students will be asking those folks, the stakeholders, to uh, push the institution itself to make change, right? So these are the taxpayers, for instance, or the parents of a school, the customers of a business, or the employees of a business. As with institutional um, change campaigns, um, the guidebook will help students identify, uh, excuse me, as with all um, campaign types, the guidebook will help students identify the audiences they wanna target. And our advisors and our cars and comm staff, like me, we're happy to help do this. Um, it, it can be pretty detail oriented, but we're really happy to work with teams to figure out their exact target audience. So now we're going to hear about uh, we're going to hear from Robin about how your team will calculate a greenhouse gas goal for their project. Okay, so now we're moving on to phase three point two, and this is where your team will learn how to write a well defined, measurable goal. This is a really important part of the campaign because this is where they'll calculate the amount of greenhouse gas that their project will reduce or that their project will prevent from being produced. So this stage does get a little bit complicated because they're going to take into account the project they're working on and some numbers associated with that. So it will require some certain information that's best provided by their advisor. 
Um, so we ask that each team schedule a mandatory meeting with their advisor at this point in order to fill out the 3.2 questionnaire and figure out their measurable greenhouse gas goal. So we will work on this together with your team. Now, once we've helped them gather the information they need for 3.2, writing a strong measurable goal for their project will be really easy. Uh, the 3.3 questionnaire is where the students will summarize their findings from 3.2 and record their greenhouse gas reduction goal. So now it's back to James, who will explain how the teams will use their knowledge and goals to develop key messages for their project. Okay, so once students have set their goals for the impact they wish to bring about, they're going to set their key messages. Why? This is because it allows them to hone their calls to action and the specific messaging they're using. These key messages will generate the basis of their argument. So in the next step in phase three, it's to pick their campaign strategies. Uh, a campaign strategy example would be social media messaging or emails or presentations. And they're going to use their key messages when writing all of the outreach materials and presentations. So, um, so this is gonna really be the basis for them to actually write the things that they're gonna say. And uh, during phase four, they're gonna be implementing all of this stuff and actually be telling people their message and, and making people um, and, and, and presenting their call to action to these folks. So these key messages are a really great starting place for that. The first thing to note is that students will be writing a key message for each target audience. Every target audience has a different thing that needs to be said to them that's most effective. So they're gonna write a key message for each of them. For the students' key messages, they'll use this simple structure. First, an attention getting fact or statistic. Second, they'll describe why this fact or problem is important to their target audience. And finally, they'll share their call to action as it relates to the target audience. Again, it's okay to have different calls to action that are specifically geared to the target audience. So to, get, uh, to, to give you guys a little bit of, uh, more information, let's dig into an example. So we're gonna stick with the food list um, example, right? So this uh, is a key message example. Uh, I'll read it out here in a second. And keep in mind as you, as you look through this, that the target audience is the household food purchaser. Did you know that Americans waste 25% of the food they buy? Think of all the money you could save on groceries by not wasting food. It's time to do something about it. Plan your week's meals before going to the grocery store. So let's break this down a little bit. First, we describe the problem in attention getting way. Did you know that Americans waste 25% of the food they buy? That's a lot. Um, and, and a lot of advocacy campaigns around food waste put this front and center. It's really attention grabbing for people who buy groceries. Second, we describe why this problem is important to our target audience. Uh, the target audience is again, household food purchasers. So we wanted to focus on the grocery store and on saving money. Every time somebody goes to the grocery store or buys food, they're thinking about getting the lowest price for what they want. Finally, we share the call to action as it relates to the target audience. Right, this is plan your week's meals before going to the grocery store. This is a great way to cut down on food waste, obviously, but it also, um, household food purchasers know how helpful it is to go to the grocery store with a good list, right? Asking them to plan their meals in advance is actionable, and it's directly related to the thing that defines the target audience. This isn't saying, okay, cool, you could save a lot of money at the grocery store. Now, the next time you're in line at cafeteria, make sure you get your, you know, you get only what you want to eat, right? This is perfectly tailored to the target audience. Uh, because this can be difficult, even, even folks who've worked in, in the field for years have trouble writing a key audience to a target or a key message for a target audience. We created this uh, helpful worksheet that guides students to actually produce this. Um, it's optional, but it, it's a tool that we developed to help. So now it's your turn to practice writing a key message. Let's make it a message for an institutional change campaign to get your school cafeteria to set up a food donation policy for unwanted whole fruits and sealed packaged goods. Your target audience will be nutritional, the nutritional services department because they are the decision makers for how food is handled in the school cafeteria. Let's take two minutes to answer these three questions above and then click the raise hand icon to read your key message. It doesn't have to be perfect, this is just practice.
Once you have a key message that you're willing to share with everyone, please uh, use the raised icon, raised hand icon. All right, let's see if we can get a couple new folks who haven't talked yet to put their hand up. Just like a teacher at school, right? Let's hear from someone new. All right, so let's first hear from um, Rebecca. Can you go ahead and unmute and share your key message with us? A lot of buttons to push. All right. <laughs> um, so I have, um, have you seen the trash bins lately? Let's re reduce food waste. The school will save money. Um, Oh, less waste equals more money and less work. Um, let students choose what they want and provide more choice. That's as far as I got. Since our school, you know, they give the kids, um, they have to take one of everything and yeah. they won't, they don't eat it all. Yeah, you know? that's a big um, issue, especially in a lot of public schools where it's a government requirement to take a certain amount of different foods. And that's something that we've, we've battled with. And some ways of getting away from that is like a share basket or. Right. Food. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing, Rebecca. Um, let's hear from um, Susan, one of our, she's been with us for quite some time. Susan, can you unmute? Oh, yes. Hi, thank you. Oh, Susan, we can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It sounds really far away. Maybe if you talk really loud or you could type yours in and I could read it off for you. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. I feel like that commercial. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, oh, thank you for giving me the option to speak up. Um, so I know I chatted in there with Anjali, but um, our nutrition services, um, we fought big time with them, mainly because um, they were very obstinate about um, the legality of it. But I found out that last year, California finally made it a law or legislative law that um, unopened food can be donated to um, places such as Google. And um, they still didn't believe me. So I have to pull up all kinds of information and data just to provide to them. And then finally, um, you know, they finally allowed it. And so we worked through, um, we worked with Second Harvest to protect all the food that was in all the food. So um, I think when you want to make a point, um, if you pull up a lot of, um, let's say, laws and things like that, it sort of um, gives administration that, oh, you actually did research into it, and um, that it's a serious process for you. So that's really, you know, my main takeaway was that I had to pull up a lot of statistics and a lot of, uh, you know, laws and facts in order for them to finally, I guess, agree to it or believe it. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Susan. I'm just going to repeat a little bit um, of what Susan said because I know there's um, some folks that couldn't hear. Um, just some tips on, you know, 
especially, um, I know a lot of folks are out here in California. We have laws um, that protect um, schools and other entities from donating um, um, leftover food and things like that. And there are, there's a lot of pushback sometimes from schools for donating, but we need to do the research um, to show our um, folks that are, you know, in those positions to make decisions that there are laws that, that protect us um, when we do donate. So that's, that's definitely there. Thank you so much for um, sharing, Susan. Let's do one more. Um, we have uh, Marie, who I believe is all the way over in Cameroon, Africa. Like, Marie, can you um, unmute and share your key message with us? Marie Noel, are you able yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thank Hello. you for sharing. All right. Um, this, um, to describe the food waste problem in my school cafeteria in attention getting way. Actually, um, close to 40% of food in my school is being used um, for waste. And to describe why this problem is important uh, to the nutrition service department, it's cause um, given, uh, given the fact that I'm in Cameroon and many people cannot, cannot, cannot benefit of a three square meal. So I see this food going to waste. Um, and they they don't actually consider uh, uh, um, the, the the quantity that these students can actually consume. And how a lot I would love to share my action. Uh, sorry, share your call to action as um, as it relates to the nutrition service department. My call to action is that uh, then 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 my school wasting wasting this food. They could actually have a garden and 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 do um, compost this uh, this food waste so as to produce a bio um, a bio products rather than having the food buy from buy food from far far distances and transporting it to school, creating more greenhouse gas emissions. So the the food that goes into waste, we can actually compost it and have it in a garden and cultivate our own food. That's what I that's what I think. That's wonderful, Marie. We love hearing that example. Um, it's great. It keeps it all full circle within your school. You're using the compost. Um, you're turning the leftover food waste into compost and then growing food on campus in your own garden. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to read um, one, one of our Grades of Greens examples, too. Um, so here's one of the key messages that we put together. Did you know that students at our school throw away untouched fruits and packaged food every day at lunch, but that our city has families who go to bed hungry every night? Rather than encourage our students to waste perfectly good food, we can teach them food is valuable by providing a responsible option for their unwanted food. Let's set up a food donation system in our cafeteria. So that was an example um, that we put together and that really addresses all three uh, prompts that James has shared with us. Um, one other thing that I wanna touch on since we are covering food and we got a great comment um, that a lot, of, a lot of kids aren't actually on campus right now, as we know and we've, we've mentioned. So if you're not on campus, um, some schools are still providing lunches and food to families. Um, one of the concerns that I've realized, um, you know, I've noticed that there's an elementary school down the street from me. Not all those families are, are taking up that opportunity to get those lunches from the schools. So finding out what's happening with those, those leftover lunches and the leftover food there. So even though kids aren't in school, there are still schools with, the, with leftover food and there might actually be more of it now. Um, so that could be one way to to find out what's going on with your um, nutritional services at your school. So let's go ahead and, um, and move on and turn it back over to James. Okay, so now what we're gonna be doing is talking about campaign strategies and advocacy goals. Um, uh, up until this point, um, and through this point really, the students have been developing the, the sort of um, the ammo um, for the messages that they're going to be creating. Um, and this is the part in this phase where they're actually going to be picking the things that they're going to be doing and using the, the things that they developed up until this point 
to, to actually go out and take action. So this is the final step in the planning process before they actually set a task list, which is the next part. Um, so campaign strategies and advocacy goals. Let's talk about what these are a little bit. Campaign strategies are the, um, the actual things that students will be doing to get their message out to their target audience. For instance, social media campaigns, email campaigns, presentations, things of that nature. There are two main ways for students to decide the strategies that they'll be doing. First is by the campaign type itself. Students can go back to phase 2.2 to review. Um, for instance, um, let's, let's break some of these down. For instance, uh, the institutional change campaign, that campaign type, typically relies heavily on presentations to decision makers. But students may need to use social media campaigns or email campaigns to influence the stakeholders of that institution before they need to do those presentations, right? And so thinking through that, thinking through how they're going to be using their campaign type informs the kinds of strategies that they're going to pick when trying to do their, when, when doing their project. The second way that students can do this is by thinking through the most direct way to reach their target audience. This is the other reason that we have students pick their target audiences in advance. For instance, it's probably better to reach parents via direct email rather than relying on parents to see a social media post on a page that they follow. But when it's hard to get an audience's emails, let's say you're targeting household food purchasers in your community, it may be better for students to actually do a social media campaign on relevant um, accounts that, that the people in their community may follow. On this page um, and during this part of this phase, we will have very specific guidance on each strategy, and we will include information on the advocacy goals that they'll set and how to measure their reach, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. The other thing that I wanna mention here is when picking campaign strategies, this is a really great time to engage your advisor and also engage the common staff on Grades of Green. I am more than happy to meet with and talk to an individual student team to say, okay, well, what's your goals? Um, what are you trying to do for your project? Let's find out the best strategies that are going to be easy for you to do and actually have um, some, some things that they can do that will actually make a change. I'm, I'm happy to do this. I've been doing it for years. I would love to work with your students one-on-one uh, -on -one to get this done. So now what we're going to be talking about is advocacy goals. Um, advocacy goals are a really critical part of, of, the, of the campaign process. Um, and so what do we mean when we talk about advocacy goals? Well, um, as you remember, Robin was just telling you a little bit ago about the greenhouse gas goals that the students are going to be setting. The greenhouse gas goals that we discussed measure the students' impact, but the advocacy goals actually measure their actions, the things that they're doing, the actions that they're taking. Basically, advocacy goals are the goals the team set for the actions, right? How many emails are they going to be sending? Where are they getting their lists from? How many posts are they going to write for social media? Who do they plan to meet with? They're going to be setting their goals for these so that in the next step, when they're actually putting together a task list saying, you know, this person is going to be doing this on this, by this date, this person's going to be doing that. By setting these advocacy goals and setting their action goals, basically they're going to know what to, what, what basically to use in that task list. It's building this task list for them. And it's okay if they don't know all of their goals at this stage. Advisors will help set these. And again, comms staff will be able to help set these. It's really important that they, they set these out, right? For any sort of project management, you need to know the things that you're going to be doing to actually achieve success in your project. And that's why setting these advocacy goals here is really important. Again, I want to mention every single one of these strategies, social media, presentations, email marketing, press outreach, each and every one of those, we are providing the advocacy goals that the students need to set. They don't need to come up with, oh, what are my advocacy goals for this? They can literally look at our list and say, okay, I need to have an answer for this and for this. We're trying to make it as easy and as, as simple for students to get this done right. The final piece, which is very, very important, is that students during the actual implementation part of the phase in phase four need to measure their reach, right? They're not gonna be able to really necessarily set their reach goals in advance, hopefully they can, but these are things that are kind of unknown. And so while students are taking action and meeting their advocacy goals, they have to measure and track the reach of their message. And so this could be the reach of a social media post. It could be the size of the audience that they speak to at a presentation, or the number of students that received an email with their message. Students will be tracking their reach for two primary audiences, their fellow students and members of the community. 
um, will, or again, when they're picking these advocacy goals, are going to see the things that they need to measure. We're taking all of the guesswork out of it. So again, if they're doing an email marketing campaign, the thing that they need to measure is how many people receive that email. We definitely want to make it very easy for students to know, here are the expectations. The biggest part that we're mentioning this year, and the piece that I want to really underline, is that when it comes to, for our judges to actually be judging the students' uh, projects, they're going to be looking directly at reach statistics and their advocacy goals to say, the students said that they were going to do this, were they able to achieve that? And then who did they talk to? How many people did they influence? This is one of the big pieces that we're gonna be judging. Obviously the other piece is their impact, right? But this is one of the pieces that students will be judged on um, at, at the end when we're deciding on our eco grades. So now that we've talked about um, a, lot of the, a lot of the message creation um, and, and the strategies that students will actually be using, now we're gonna turn it over to Malcolm to lead us through the last step of phase three. Awesome, thanks James. Um, so now, once your team has established their key messaging, campaign strategies, and advocacy goals, they're now ready to create a master task list. Here is where they'll lay out how to achieve their goals, implement their strategies, and send their key messages. Your students will be asked to submit a short but detailed description of the tasks that they need to complete to achieve their goals, as well as the date that each task should be completed by, and the name of the team member or team members who will complete the task. Once your students complete this, they will fill out the 3.6 task list questionnaire and they'll be fully ready to implement their project. So this again brings us to the end of phase three. Um, another reminder that we will be covering phases four and five in the next facilitator training on January 30th. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Anjali to bring us home. All right, thanks everyone for hanging in so much. We're so excited to share all this information with you. So um, similar to the graphic you saw at the beginning, the map, um, just some important things to remember that um, we, we talked about eco grants, all teams who complete all phases um, of the campaign will be eligible um, to get one of those eco grants. And we are having our welcome webinar for all students. Um, on October 3rd, um, and that will be, we hope that you can attend live. The more students, the better. So um, please try to get your students to register. We'll send that um, RSVP, RSVP link out in the email after this, and it's also at the bottom of the Get Ready page. Um, we'll do another student webinar on February 6th, so look out for that. And then um, the additional training, like this one, will be on January 30th, as Malcolm mentioned. Um, and then a couple exciting things, I had mentioned October 8th, the virtual uh, LA County Sanitation District's virtual tour. Some of you have, may have gone on this tour live with us. It's something we do every year. It is so cool. We get super nerdy. You get to see a materials recovery facility. You get to see trash trucks come in. You get to see what happens to all the trash. They also have a water waste treatment plant. It is, it's really cool and inspiring to see um, what happens. Um, I know as far as next weekend, October 3rd, I know there are some conflicts. Um, we, realized, we realized a couple days ago that some high school folks might not be able to attend because we know it's SATs. We're so sorry for the conflict. Um, it will be recorded, so we will send that out afterwards. Um, and as you can see, the bottom thing on this slide is one of my favorite things. Um, it's something we call the Impactathon. It's um, an opportunity for students to share their project and the impact they've had, all the success that they've had throughout the year um, with us. It's kind of like a, a science fair type platform. Um, we have, if we're able to do it in person, we might be able to do that. If not, we will do it virtually. And for um, our global teams, it will be virtual. You'll have an opportunity per, to present there as well. Um, and then the time, I just got a question. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, the time on October 8th for the virtual tour, I believe it's at 1215. So 1215 Pacific. Pacific Standard Time. We'll send that um, information out in an email as well. All right, and again, if you guys ha continue to have questions while we're wrapping up, um, please continue to put them in the chat and we will address as many as we can. And now I wanna just hand it back 
to Robin, um, one of our advisors, as you've heard from, who's been with us for a very long time. So she can give you a lot of expert advice on some best practices for the campaign. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Anjali. Um, so we know that you guys have differing levels of experience with the Grades of Green campaign. Some of you have been with us for a long time, and for some of you, this is your first campaign. So we've put together a little list of our best practices to help you out. Um, the first one is in organizing a big group. If you have a larger group of students on your team, such as a classroom or a school club, you may want to break them into smaller groups to help you manage them easier. So you can do this either by having them form separate teams that will work on separate projects, or you can organize them into committees who will be responsible for different tasks within the same project. Um, another one is about tracking your campaign. So um, it's a good idea to copy the questions on the questionnaires throughout the guidebook into a Word doc for collaborative working. So for the majority of the questions that will be filled out in the guidebook, we really only want one submission per team. So in order to allow the team to work on these collaboratively, we suggest copying the questions to a Word document that the team can work on together. Then once the team feels confident that their answers are ready, one student can copy these onto the website guidebook and submit them. Um, another best practice is for storing work. So store materials in a secure online location. Um, be sure to have an online location where you'll keep a copy of all your project materials. And this includes the Word documents that your team's been working on, as well as um, documentation of things they've done. So for instance, if your team has made flyers or social media posts, emails, um, surveys, pictures, anything like that, it's a really great idea to store all this stuff in one online location. And then the last um, best practice we have is helping your team keep track of your impacts throughout the campaign. Um, so make sure the students are measuring their results and documenting their actions throughout each phase of the campaign and keeping track of any impact data that they collect. So it's all e really easy to find and report at the end. Um, so those are a few best practices for you. Please reach out to your advisor if you have any other questions. And now back to Anjali, who will tell you about your next steps. All right, thanks, Robin. Um, so some next steps, if you haven't already, register your team. Again, that will be, um, the link will be shared in the email that I send out afterwards. Um, and then also make sure every member um, of the team, every student, has completed the consent and permission form with a guardian. And then as a team, fill out one about our team form. Um, and then also um, have your students RSVP for the welcome webinar on October 3rd. Even if you can't attend live, please RSVP so we know um, if you're attending live or if you'll be watching the recording afterwards. Um, and then I think there's a typo on this last one. I believe the time um, for the virtual field trip is 1215. I apologize for that. 1215 on October 8th. Um, and yeah, so that's 1215 on October 8th. That will also be recorded. Um, so we'll be able to send that out as well. We know um, some people might be in class. Um, so it is a student virtual field trip. Um, teachers, adult facilitators are welcome to join as well with their students, but all students are welcome for that. I don't believe there's a maximum on how many students can attend either. So um, please feel free to join um, and we'll send out the, the link and information for that. All right. So we've come to the end. Thank you so much. That concludes our first um, team facilitator training. Um, we're, in the end of the chat, I'm going to go ahead and send out the, the training evaluation form um, so we can re record your attendance for that stipend. Um, I'll put that link there. Um, and then we'll have just a final word from Kim after that. Um, you're f feel free to leave, but if you have further questions or just want to talk with an advisor, um, please please stay on, type your, uh, your questions in the chat. We'll definitely answer those as we can. Um, we'll, and then we'll be sending out the recording of this program, links from the chat, 
in an FAQ sheet um, for those of you that are unable to, to stay for the end of this. If any um, questions come up, we'll go ahead and share those with you via email. So again, look for that email from me. Um, my email is Anjali K at gradesofgreen.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. In the chat, in the chat is the chat as well. Oh, I'm getting oh, some I'm getting some I'm gonna hand it hand it over. <laughs> hand it, hand it over. All right. Um, thanks all. Um, first, I just really want to thank our amazing Grades of Green team. <clears throat> I'm in awe of them every day. They are just they are truly committed and dedicated to your students, um, to you and to our environment. And I know they are so excited to work with you one-on-one -on -one this year. I think you can tell that they, um, they're very um, knowledgeable and clearly want to make an impact and help your students make an impact. So thank you, team. That was fantastic. And of course, <clears throat> thank you all of you for joining us for a few hours this Saturday. Um, once again, we so appreciate your dedication um, to helping us help your students make real impacts in their community. So looking forward to seeing you on January 30th for um, our second training. That's phases four and five. They're really fun. It's where the impact happens um, and they can bring their um, passion into reality. So we're excited to work with you and your teams. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Anjali or your advisor or me or James. Um, we're all here to help you um, help your students. So have a great day and um, hopefully we'll see you October 3rd or October 8th for that really cool virtual tour. Thanks, Kim. And um, I think there were a few that wanted to stay on and ask some questions. So feel free to do that. Um, if you want to raise your hand, we can um, do it that way, or you can type um, your questions in the chat. But we will have advisors on um, at least till about 12.15. So we can go ahead and do that. And then the evaluation form um, is in the chat. I sent that out. So please click on that before you jump off so you have that open in your window and can do that right away while it's fresh in your mind. Thank you so much. Let's see, I'm trying to make sure that we've addressed all the questions that we've got in the chat. Um, field trip, the virtual field trip is, you know, like I, I think I addressed that definitely um, for students and the adult facilitator. Everyone is welcome to join that. And yeah, collaborating with other schools. Um, thanks, Susan. Susan asked, do the students from another school have to be part of Grades of Green? No, we would love it if they are, of course. <laughs> uh, but no, they definitely don't. We've had, um, We've had a lot of like high school, high school teachers uh, or high school teams and uh, middle school teams that work like with the younger students in their district. So that's a great way to do it. Um, so yeah, definitely they don't need to, they don't absolutely have to be part of grade screen. No, thanks for the question, Susan. Um, the link for the field trip, yes, we'll send that out. Um, so please just save the date and time for now if you can attend. And like I said, that will also be recorded. So we can send that out after October 8th if you're not able to attend. And let's see, the welcome webinar. Um, so the welcome webinar is for students. We absolutely encourage the adult facilitator um, to attend. We always, we say adult facilitator because some of you are teachers, some of you are parents. Um, so we want to make sure that we're including everybody. But yes, the adults are welcome to attend as well. And we definitely like all the students uh, to attend to be on that. And let's see. And the, um, just to give you guys a heads up, the virtual tour on October 8th, it's only, it's only going to be about 30 minutes. So it's a, quick, it's a quick thing that maybe if students are on lunch break, they can, they can help out with that. The other thing, uh, this is James, the other thing I want to mention about that is if you're trying to plan uh, a lesson plan around it, because we're going to be recording it, we can actually provide that um, pretty quickly so that you guys can um, can build that into lesson plans if needed for, for additional sections of your class or something like that. 
Okay, any other questions? I'm not seeing any raised hands or anyone come through. Um, let's see, one other thing. Okay. Um, the evaluation form. Oh, okay. Um, thanks, Roberto. Um, we got it pointed out that the evaluation form has questions about the first video, um, which we had um, issues on. So how can we access that? I'm going to go ahead and send that video in the chat right now. I'll pull that up and put that in the chat. And I can also um, include that in the, um, the email that I send afterwards so that we can send that out. Um, and then Eric, I'll send your comments over to Robin as well. So give me one second to pull up this video. Ah. Oh, it's gonna start playing. <laughs> See. Thanks, Malcolm. The younger employees are always faster than me. He sent me the link before I could get to it. <laughs> there you go, everyone. So there's the link. Um, that's the the link to phase 1.1 um, of the campaign. So you'll be able to see phase one, and also that video um, is the first thing on there. All right. All right. And so at this point, I think everyone can jump off. Um, and a couple advisors have asked you to stay on if you guys can stay on for just a few minutes. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We can't wait to work with all of you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.